a colorful lion dance at the Georgia Capitol today in celebration of the Year of the Dragon. The dance not only celebrated the new year, but drives away evil spirits and ushers in good luck and blessings. All good things to bring to the Gold Dome during the legislative session. Good evening and welcome to Lawmakers on this 21st day of the General Assembly. I'm Donna Lowry in Atlanta. We're going to learn more about festivities on Asian American Advocacy Day at the Capitol coming up. Plus, joining us in the studio are two members of the Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus who will tell us about legislation they're sponsoring. Also, the bill some refer to as the Don't Say Gay Bill is advancing toward a vote in the Senate. The bill's sponsor says labeling it anti-gay is unfair. And a lawmaker joins us in the studio to talk about a variety of education issues, including the Safe Schools Act, especially in light of a recent school shooting in his district. Let's get right to the news of the day with our Capitol correspondent, Sarah Callis. Hi, Donna. Lawmakers mark day 21 with a special celebration and bills aiming to help families. The Asian American and Pacific Islander Caucus celebrated the Lunar New Year and presented resolutions honoring community members. The celebration included traditional dress and food and a friendly red lion said to bring good luck for the coming year. I can think of no better week for us to gather together and celebrate our community achievements together as a family. And as such, we have a series of four resolutions to present commending the work of some of our most important community leaders. You honor us all with your presence here today, and I'm so proud to be able to celebrate with all of you. Before the bills of the day were discussed in the Senate, the shooting in Kansas City and the corresponding rise in gun violence was noted on the floor. It is our responsibility as lawmakers, as members of these communities, and as humans to work towards solutions that ensure the safety and security of all individuals. So let us honor the memory of those we have lost to gun violence by committing ourselves to take action, to advocate for change, and to create a future where events like those at the Chiefs Parade and Mays High School become a thing of the past. The rapid increase in home valuations across the state was addressed in Senate Bill 349. The bill will cap the yearly rate that home values can be taxed at 3%, regardless of the estimated value that a county assesses. Now, currently, the homeowner gets a notice of increased value. They will continue to get a notice of increased value, but will know that no matter what the tax assessors value their property at, it cannot go up more than 3% in a year. But there was some concern over taking away control from local government over the millage rates. Um, we have heard some opposition from our school boards. I understand that there is an argument that maybe the school boards are inflating their, their, their numbers and inflating their... Um, their losses, but I think we should consider that legislation like this is best handled by our local bodies and our local school boards and working with our counties. They would best know what their numbers were as far as for guidance and their losses. Despite the concerns, the bill passed 42 to 7. SB 443 would allow city authorities to hold unsanctioned event organizers liable for any cost and liabilities that a municipality would have to incur. Tabby Island had $187,000 worth of expenses. They know who the promoters are, and this will allow them to get the recoup their expenses for providing uh, the security, the emergency services, the porta potties, uh, and certainly, um, you know, uh, liability insurance from that standpoint. While the bill was written specifically to address the Tabby Island Orange Crush event that has been ongoing for the past two decades, it would apply to all of Georgia's cities and towns. This bill in no way impacts the right uh, for any group to have a peaceful protest, does it not? No, absolutely not. That bill passed 47 to 1. The House approved a bill that would double paid parental leave for state employees. Full-time state employees are currently eligible for three weeks of paid parental leave. House Bill 1010 would extend that period to six weeks. This will provide a low-cost, high-value benefit to our state employees. As I mentioned from the well, we are the largest employer in the state. And so it really will make a difference for a lot of men and women. And frankly, women in particular, two thirds of state employees are female. Supporters of HB 1010 say it gives new parents time to recover and bond with their child. This is also a time for learning how to adjust to a new routine. 
changing diapers, establishing a feeding schedule, and finding that time to sleep whenever you can. And we can't leave out the invaluable bonding time with the newest member or members of our family. Also, as was stated, most child care centers do not accept infants younger than six weeks. So this bill also addresses child care issues as well. The bill passed 153 to 11. Also in the House, members honored the Nigerian Consulate General. Tomorrow on day 22, lawmakers will return to the Capitol. They are expected to discuss sexual assault crisis center funding and environmental policy in two press conferences. That's all for my Capitol Report. Donna, back to you. Thank you, Sarah, for that report. Since the beginning of the month, six people have suffered injuries because of shootings at Georgia schools, and a 15-year-old has died. The first one occurred on February 1st at Cobb County's McEachern High School, where two people were shot. Last Friday, a 15-year-old was shot and killed at Fulton County's Tri-Cities High. And last night at Atlanta's Benjamin E. Mays High School, four people were shot but didn't have life-threatening injuries. In light of those shootings, one representative wants to reopen a bipartisan school safety law. Joining us now is Democratic Representative David Wilkerson of Powder Springs. He's on the House Education Committee and the Budget and Oversight Committee. Welcome to the show. Uh, so let's get started. You're, you're in, McEachern mm -hmm. is in your district. Your thoughts on what's taking place? Yes, uh, first I would like to extend my prayers to the families of all the victims. Um, I can't imagine sending your child to school and then and then seeing something on the news and then I've heard from parents where they're shocked when, once they realize their child was involved and so my, my prayers go out to the family that lost their child as well as those that are going through everything right now. Um, and so, yes, I want to look back at what we did, the great bipartisan work we did on 147 as far as school safety, uh, active shooter drills, and see how we can improve upon the lessons learned because every child should feel, uh, feel safe at school. And I know that's one of the priorities we have in the Education Committee. Yeah, and so it would involve just going back over some things. I know right now the governor has in the budget money to go toward schools school systems coming up with safety measures, but maybe yeah. there's more? Yeah, so right now, the way the money goes to the districts is we give them an allotment of money and they have it per school, but it's up to them how they decide to use it. So for the case of a McEachern in high school, they may say uh, it could be cameras or they may want to allocate some resources to making sure the grounds are protected in the first place and, and having police officers on the grounds during the day. That's something that is probably worth a conversation, but right now it all goes to the district. Yeah, I know what, there's a town hall meeting taking place right now yes. on this issue in, the, in, uh, in your district. So uh, I appreciate you talking about that and we'll keep up with whatever you. you decide to do with that. Um, let's, let's talk about more education issues. I know you really care about some of the things going into the budget, including things to help educate college kids, to keep kids going to school. Talk about that a little yes. bit. Yes, so several years ago, I actually had a bill that would um, look at how we, a parent could allocate some money and then the state would match it. Uh, it did not end up passing, but we've done some things since then. Uh, we've gotten rid of the fees that we added several years ago. Uh, I know that's been a savings anywhere from $200 to $500 per semester. And those are bipartisan requests, but the Board of Regents did it based on the uh, amount of money that we're putting into the budget for college students. Um, completion grants are available as well. So we are allocating, in a lot of ways, the resources we need, but we still have a lot of work to do because we have a, a shortage of labor and we need to make sure that that whether it's technical school, whether it's colleges, that we are educating our students for jobs of the future. Any specific legislation? As right now, we're just trying to get money in the budget. Now, literacy is the big one, to be honest with you. Literacy is, is, is uh, major as far as making sure that we can fund the programs that we say we care about. And last year, some of the things were disregarded, so hopefully that we will get those all the way through as far as we have a young men's program, for example, in the city of Atlanta that's working with Atlanta schools where we bring in students that may be interested in being teachers, African-American males. And that literacy program has been extremely successful. We love to see some state money put in for that. Okay, we'll keep up with that. So I want you to stay here, um, but we're going to come back to you in a moment. We're going to hear about another education bill sponsored by Republican Senator Cardin Summers. It's SB 88, the Parents and Children Protection Act of 2023. I talked to him about it this morning and also his bill to legalize gambling. 
We're going to Senate Bill 88 for three sessions. Uh, we have narrowed the bill down. We work with every group that's come to see us about getting what we needed to be in the bill and getting what their concerns were in or either out of the bill. Senate Bill 88 is a very transparent bill. So that's all it is. Transparent bill that says that if you're going to talk gender to a child under 16 years of old, age, anybody in loco parentis, over or two ever is in charge of a child, whether, whether it be, they have to get permission or notification to a parent or a guardian to talk gender to them. And that is it. It is completely transparent. After 16 years old, the child, they're on their own. Yeah. There's been different iterations. You just said that. What has changed? Oh, bunches has changed. Working with the, the, the groups, the LBGTQ families, the, the, the equality groups or whatever, trying to get their language in the bill that, that made the bill actually much more palatable to everybody so they were on board with it. Now there's some people out there, Ms. Donald, that's going to try to morph this thing into something that's not. This bill is simply a transparent bill that simply says, once again, if you're going to talk gender to a child, you have to have a parent or guardian's written permission or notification of that parent. Now, if that teacher or the person in charge of that child is concerned about that child's safety at home, that teacher or that person in charge can notify a counselor or a uh, Hit, uh, somebody that knows what they're doing and they can talk with that child with no repercussions whatsoever and work with that child. How does this differ from Florida's bill? I don't honestly know how to answer that question. I don't know. I mean, ours is, you know, you know, Florida's gets labeled the don't say gay, this, 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 that. This has absolutely nothing. In fact, we had a room full of gay people with us testifying in favor of the bill. What about your bill that deals with a constitutional amendment change? Well, we have a bill. I, I, I think I have authored the, the cleanest CA ever before that will come before the House and the Senate. Now, the question is if we can get it out in time, because as you know, time is running out and Thursday is our deadline. Uh, next Thursday, excuse me, is our deadline. Uh, my CA is a bill that allows you, the people, to decide if you want to remove the prohibition of gaming off the Georgia Constitution. And right now what we have is, you know, we have a lottery, but that's not a quote, quote, gambling. That's a lottery. You can call it what you want to. But when you go to talking about casinos or sports betting, all the above, that's clearly in our Constitution. It's not allowed unless it's removed from the Constitution. And I don't believe that the legislatures, the Senate and the House, should be making that decision for the people of Georgia when it's a constitutional amendment. It should be the people of Georgia making that decision. And I want to be able to put it on the ballot and let people decide if they want that. If they vote for it, we could have sports betting and casinos in Georgia. If they vote against it, then the issue is put to bed and that's it. What we've seen is people wanting an amendment to, to allow gambling. You're saying there's something all already in the Constitution that prohibits. Yes, ma'am. The Constitution prohibits gambling specifically. Our Constitution does. This amendment, if passed, would do away with that prohibition, which would allow gambling in Georgia. Yes, ma'am. How are you thinking that's going to do? Oh, I think it'll pass the flying colors because people want the opportunity to, to, to vote on this. And, you know, Ms. Donna, nobody has to go in a casino if they don't want to. I mean, nobody makes anybody buy a lottery ticket. You buy them. I mean, look what the lottery has done for, for education in Georgia. I mean, we're five billion dollars in our lottery, or maybe six billion dollars right now to the good. We can help young people big time. And this, uh, the money that would come out of a full gambling bill, if it would be passed, would be unbelievable what it could do for education in Georgia. If it were to pass the House and the Senate, it would not be, it, the governor doesn't vote on it. It's a constitutional amendment. So two thirds of the House and the Senate have to agree to this. And if they agree to this, it would be on the ballot in November. When was it put into the Constitution? Oh, my Lord, Mr. Donald, when it was written. I mean, way back, yeah, yeah, I mean, back in the 50s and 60s, I think they even, they even changed it and made it stronger. That was Senator Cardin Summers. And so, Representative Wilkerson, I'd like to get your thoughts on the, in the on gambling. Oh, you know, not just his bill, but overall in Georgia. On the gambling or the gay bill? Yeah, yeah no, the gambling, <laughs> gambling. Okay. We'll stick with that. Uh, the Especially gambling. Since education is yeah, something you're interested yes. in. Yes, uh, the gambling, I think you see two different trains of thought. A lot of people may be okay with sports betting, but the appetite for casinos may not be there. Um, we do like the fact that uh, it goes toward education. I think that's a positive. But um, you have two things. You, have, you change the Constitution, and then you have enabling legislation, which determines how it is actually being used. Uh, one of the challenges with this legislation is it says that uh, a local county can, you can, if a local county says they don't want it, you won't put it there. 
However, if you've watched the legislature over the last few years, we've decided that local counties don't matter as much as they used to. So we may pass it and think that it's not going to be in your county, but if you get 91 votes in the House and um, the corresponding number of votes in the Senate that they need, um, you can put it in your county and disregard what the local delegation says. So while I'm in favor of um, allowing people to vote, we have to be cautious that um, what we say, unless it's in writing, and unless it's a constitutional amendment, may not exactly happen the way we say. Yeah, so what he's talking about is changing what's already there. It already prohibits it, he's saying. Take it out. He wants to take it out, but with that said, it also says that if you don't want it in your county, we won't put it there. But there's no guarantee of that. So if you legalize casinos, a casino could be in a neighborhood near you, and that may not be a choice that you have. So we'll have to keep an eye on that oh, yeah, one. Definitely. All right. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you. Appreciate that. Coming up, a look into the legislation of interest to those participating in Asian American Advocacy Day at the Capitol. Two lawmakers will talk about the Asian American Advocacy Fund and Asian Americans Advancing Justice. Stay with us. Lawmakers is made possible by Georgia Farm Bureau. With over 80 years of helping everyone understand the importance of agriculture in our state. After all, ag is Georgia's number one industry. Food and fiber production represents over 74 billion in output of Georgia's strong economy. The Georgia Farm Bureau legislative team works to represent producers across Georgia at the state capitol during the session and year round. Georgia Farm Bureau, the voice of Georgia farmers. People put their faith in PBS because they know that it is constantly delivering quality. It covers the whole of the United States. It's a free and independent media. We go where the viewers are. What are the conversations that are happening right now? We feel that civil discourse is a civic responsibility. What we do is authentic reporting that people can trust. We give time so you can hear voices on all sides of an issue. This is the place that people turn to for stories that matter. And they know that when they walk away, they will have learned something about the world around them. That's why this makes CBS important for daily life and in the end, our world. Thank you for joining us. Community. Learning, working, playing, celebrating. Doing life is always better together. At GPB, we aim to provide you with the tools to be able to do life together well. Our mission to educate, inform, and entertain inspires everything from our wide range of programming to our stimulating radio conversations to our fun in-person events. We've got something for everyone. Visit gpb.org slash community to learn more about our upcoming events. Welcome back to Lawmakers, I'm Donna Lowry. Uh, Lunar New Year festivities, they just filled the Capitol today. Two of the lawmakers behind the Asian American Advocacy Day join us now. Democratic Representative Michelle Al is from Johns Creek. Her House committee assignments include budget and fiscal affairs oversight and public health. And here also is Democratic Representative Long Tran of Dunwoody. He's on creative arts and entertainment and technology and infrastructure innovation. Welcome to you both. Thank you for having us. It was a fun us. day. Loved watching the lion in action. Can you guys talk about that a little bit, what the, the ceremony was and all of that? I don't know. Who wants to start? Do you want to start? I'll get started. Yeah. So today was Lunar New Year Day at the Capitol, and it was a chance for Georgia's inaugural legislative AAPI caucus, Asian American Pacific Islander caucus, to really welcome members of the Asian American community to the Capitol, show them that they had a place there, show them that um, this was their house too, and to encourage them to continue to do what they've been doing for many, many decades in Georgia, which is to advocate for issues most important to their community. Yeah, and you guys did it in the big way. Explain what this is all about in terms of what we're seeing on the screen right now. So. The lion dance is across so many of our, the different cultures, whether it's Korean, Chinese, Vietnamese, and it's meant to ward off the bad spirits and bring in the good spirits of the new year and, you know, start the new year with positive energy and excitement. And so it's always fantastic. And you'll see us wave these little red pockets that we give kids, but we also give to the lion it's, it's itself. I love that. So I love that you were, you were festive, you came festive for us. 
Tell us yes. about what you have there. So in Vietnamese culture, it's called an ao yai, and you'll see some similarities with Michelle's out outfit, which is uh, Chinese-based. But uh, for the men, and this is a little bit small for our head, the full formal wear is the, 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 this little thing. And <laughs> but I love that. But, yeah. Does it mean anything in particular? Not really. It's just our, our formal wear from thousands of years ago. and. People still wear it today, though the, the modern day ones are a little bit more stylish. That's cool. Anything you want to talk about what you're wearing? It just looks fabulous on you. This is a Chinese traditional outfit. It's called a cheng sam, which literally means long shirt. But it's something <laughs> that a lot of Chinese women will tend to wear during more formal affairs. And the reason that we did make a point, uh, many members of the Asian American Pacific Islander Caucus, to dress in cultural clothes today was to do two things. One is to make sure that Asian culture was visible at the Capitol, which was really important for a lot of our community members to see that. And the second thing was to show people the diversity even within the AAPI caucus, right? Because I think sometimes people tend to think of Asian communities as all one type of people. And in truth, when you look at the 11 members of our AAPI caucus, you can see that we represent a large number of different cultures. For people who don't know, name a few of the different um countries that are represented, or cultures, I should right. say. And we'd love to continue to grow our AAPI caucus, so we have even more people to name, that Long is Vietnamese, I'm Chinese, uh, Marvin Lim is Filipino, we have two Korean members with Sam Park and Sue Hong, um, Charlize Bird also has Chinese background, we have a rural Roman who is Palestinian, we have several people from Pakistan, and, it's, um, and we have some Bangladeshi Americans too, so it's yeah. really quite diverse within our caucus. Oh, it's so yeah. fun today to, to see everything. But you also had another purpose, and that is to talk about some things that you're advocating for. So let's talk about a few of those things. Absolutely. So, you know, the reason that we formed an AAPI caucus was to make sure that there was representation of AAPI voices at the Capitol, because I think that certain communities, depending on our background and our experience, we can see and perceive bills in a different way, and we can see differential impact to our communities in particular. And one thing I'd like to bring up is actually not a bill that we're advocating for, but a bill we're advocating against, which is a series of alien land law bills that are being pushed through by our Republican majority that tend to do something quite harmful to the immigrant community. And what it does is that in the guise of national security, it tends to restrict the rights of certain immigrant groups and people from certain national origins from buying land. Right. Uh, talk about that a little bit more. It's, it is, it, a lot of it has dealt with farmland in particular, but we're talking any land. And there are some, there, there's some barriers that they're, the bills are trying to set up. Right. So we've seen versions of this bill pass in many other states with conservative legislators. Uh, in particular, Texas tried to pass a bill like this, and it was actually quashed by a number of uh, very active community members in the Asian community. And Florida managed to pass a bill like this quite recently, and that's been recently enjoined in the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals for being unconstitutional. And although it's couched as an agricultural land type bill to protect um, our agricultural land from being bought up by hostile foreign powers, what it does in effect is that it uh, restricts the rights of people from certain national backgrounds from buying or leasing a number of types of property, which would be in violation of the Fair Housing Act. One thing that I think it's important for us to say is because when people who, when legislators who look like us and come from the backgrounds we do, speak about this issue, I think sometimes people tend to frame it in a way that is us um, being weak on national security or people are suspicious of our intent in terms of uh, you know, our loyalties towards the United States. And I think that that type of sentiment is exactly why these bills are so harmful, because what it tends to do is it tends to conflate individuals with their national origin. And it tends to cast doubt and loyalty, you know, uh, aspersions on people who come from certain countries, for example, China, for example, other Asian countries, for example, Russia, right? So what we're trying to do is to prioritize national security, but also do it in a way that does not have a discriminatory effect, particularly on the immigrant community. Okay. I want to get into some, some of the other things that might be unique to the AAPI community that you think that you're going to, you want to focus on in the legislature? So for me, for kind of a celebratory, but to show the growth of Georgia, I introduced the bill 1222, um, which will make 
Lunar New Year a state holiday. Ah. And so I, I'm very excited for that. Now, that's not going to mean that we get time off or pay time off, but I think it brings more awareness. What I've seen is over the last few years is we see counties and cities starting to celebrate Lunar New Year. And Lunar New Year just isn't one day. It's across 10 days. And so that gives more flexibility for cities to do events on different days, but it creates a little bit confusion. So hopefully with this bill, people will understand what Lunar New, New Year is about. A, a lot of people thought it was last weekend. Yes. But it, it 10 days. 10 so days. Last 10 days. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are you getting any traction on that bill? Uh, not yet. But, um, you know, the, the caucus obviously supports it. And, you know, if not this year, maybe next year. Yeah. There, there are some other bills. I know there's something you in terms of justice issues that you're looking at. Talk about those. In terms of justice issues, yeah, the, one of the one of the bills was called the Asian American Justice. I, I don't know whether it was a fund or something like that, advancing justice. Right. So that I think you're referring to uh, Asian Americans advancing justice, sponsoring. That's okay. Sponsoring Asian American Advocacy Day at the Capitol okay. today. Yeah. So they had planned this day specifically to engage um, the most rapidly growing voter base in Georgia, which is the Asian American community to become more actively engaged at the legislative level, right? I think that that level of engagement is why we have one of the largest AAPI caucuses in the country, right? And that type of engagement is why Asian Americans are the fastest growing voting group in this state. So as a caucus, we are a bipartisan caucus, right? We don't do electoral work as such. However, something that we all agree on is the importance of making sure that our Asian communities in particular take advantage of their ability to vote and to participate in that process. So that's something we definitely support. Yeah. yeah. Did you want to add to that? Uh, so we introduced a few resolutions, which one of them was for the Asian American Advocacy Fund and Asian American Advancing Justice. And the reason why it's important is we see changes across the industry. If you look from Gainesville, Georgia, down to Valdosta, the growing number of chicken farmers are Vietnamese. They're buying up chicken farms, um, getting into that industry, but they don't know how to advocate at the Capitol. They don't know how to be there when it's agriculture day and how to engage with other state representatives. So having Michelle or I at the state Capitol to help them transition to that has been important. Yeah. So I want to get into something else that I know you're interested in. And you, you, we spoke earlier to Representative Wilkerson. You talked about school safety, and you are a sponsor of uh, several gun bills, but the main one is the Pediatric Health Safe Storage Act. Talk about that a little bit, especially in light of what he talked about, some of the shootings we've seen. Right. Obviously, when we see school shootings, it's the most visible and tragic effect of gun violence in this country. But what we have to remember that that is one small piece of an extremely large epidemic that takes place in this country, and there's all different types of gun violence. One thing comes clear from this, though, is that gun violence is the number one cause of death of children and teenagers in this country. Not all those deaths are as a result of school shootings. In fact, that's the vast minority of deaths. But having a society where guns are profligate and guns are easily accessed by minors is a recipe for more children being shot and killed. So the Pediatric Health Safe Storage Act, which we are continuing to work on, and I'm so grateful to all our advocates and organizers for helping us with this bill, simply states that any gun that can be accessed by a minor be stored securely, period. It's very straightforward. It's the definition of common sense gun safety reform, and I am hopeful that we continue to get good movement on this, including on other sort of um, synchronous bills that prioritize safe storage. Okay. Any other bills that you are pushing for? I'm still working on getting in-state tuition for undocumented students. Um, the reality is not just students who cross the border with their families. We have adopted kids from China, Korea, and the parents forget to fill out U.S. citizenship forms. And then next thing you know, they're 18 years old, graduating from high school, and now they're stuck without a state tuition because their adopted parents didn't fill out the proper citizenship forms. Yeah, that's something we probably don't think of and comes up on, probably on an individual basis, but yeah. probably more often than, than we think about. Yep. Yeah. I appreciate you both coming on. You look great. Absolutely. Thank you for having us. Uh, I appreciate us. it. It was so much fun to, at the Capitol today. Everybody should have been there. So glad you could have joined us. Yeah. It was fun. Thank you. That, that does it for lawmakers today. We'll be back on Tuesday as legislators take Monday off to celebrate President's Day. But look for our Capitol report on tomorrow's legislative session at the end of PBS NewsHour. Have a good night.